So I have the uh, great pleasure of, uh, of introducing uh, Dr. Uh, Heather Hudson, um, uh, Canadian by background. Okay. Um, very uh, distinguished uh, career as, as, as an academic. She, uh, she uh, uh, did her uh, doctoral work at uh, Stanford University. Can't get into Queen, she could go to Stanford. <laughs> there was no programming communication in Canada that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. That was a long time. Long ago. Uh, Columbia University in her background. Um, she planned and evaluated communication projects in northern Canada, Alaska, and more than 50 developing countries and emerging economies in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, Middle East, Eastern Europe, and the South Pacific. Uh, she's the author of many conference papers and articles, and several books, and has testified frequently as an expert witness on communication policy and issues. And she's consulted for private sector, government agencies, consumer groups, indigenous organizations, and international government organizations. So, very, hugely varied background, and wonderful depth of experience. And she's uh, currently at the University of Alaska. Very, very pleased that she accepted our invitation to come speak to us today. And Heather? Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, a wonderful opportunity to be here with you. Um, I am originally from Vancouver, uh, but my family was all from Ontario. My father was born in Brockville and grew up in Gananoque, so I came here as a child to see the Thousand Islands, and my mother's family was from southern Ontario. She went to Western and she never let us forget it. Um, and I also worked in the north, um, in northern Canada, and in the area, including we're in Ontario, the area that you heard about yesterday from Ken Carpenter. Um, what I'm going to try to do is pull together several things, so as you're in our entertainment, um, try to kind of synthesize several of the themes that we've heard about in the past couple of days including what we understand about broadband and rural development and access, um, getting beyond infrastructure, as several pointed out, that that's only part of the puzzle, getting the facilities in. Give you some information on a case study that we just completed this summer in Alaska on um, extending connectivity, broadband connectivity into several indigenous communities, and then come back to some policy issues. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, just to kind of pull together the approaches to studying broadband, and we've heard about them during this conference, I, I think there are two major approaches. One is kind of the macroeconomic analysis, and I just put here a couple of examples, and they're in the paper, and there are several in the background papers that the Monson Center has put together, and we also did a literature review as part of our last research. Um, and you heard a couple about, about the Han. They, they actually go back to some time series data that was first done by a colleague of mine when he was a grad student at Stanford, looking at telecommunications investment and GDP. And clearly, um, as is true now with broadband, wealthier economies tend to have better infrastructure and there's more demand, so obviously you would find a correlation. But he found that some successors who have used variations of time series and local regression uh, that there was a small but significant contribution of telecommunications to economic development, usually measured by GDP per capita. So we heard a couple of speakers mention similar studies done more recently in the past couple of days. Um, the World Bank came out with one a couple of years ago. Um, it had a couple of data points. I think the minister from Finland mentioned one of those this morning. Um, it talks about 1.2% increase in GDP per capita in high income economies and somewhat higher in developing countries. And I put in here that they may be comparable to some rural economies within countries. In fact, we don't have very good data doing this kind of analysis for rural areas within economies because the data just aren't usually disaggregated in terms of either investment or often economic indicators in a way that's very useful. And there have also been some <coughs> recent studies on mobile penetration and its economic impact. So that's one approach. Another is kind of the consumer surplus approach, which says, well, how much more are people willing to pay um, for benefits that aren't captured by um, the difference 
in what they're paying on a monthly basis. So are there benefits that are external, um, saving money, getting access to new services? We've heard a lot about those. Um, and if you get some data on that, can the difference tell you something about what the economic impact might be? Um, then there are another, the other approach, or other major approach is um, case studies. And we've heard several today. Um, there are a whole variety of them, and we both broke out in our literature review by sectors that we thought were relevant for Alaska. Um, and those give you kind of micro-level examples of how better communication, including broadband, um, could make a difference. Um, Raul Katz, who's a friend and colleague of mine now based at Columbia University, has done an interesting overview, and he said, um, the impact of broadband is neither automatic nor homogeneous across the economic system. Well, that's part of the problem. We don't have data. And then a couple of colleagues of his, including Mark Jameson, said, the lesson from the U.S. appears that, that broadband has a positive economic impact, but that impact cannot be analyzed with any precision. And then they add, one of the difficulties learned from studies of the effects of ICTs is that impacts evolve. So that's kind of a state clause. Um, yes, we're doing research on this, but we're not there yet, and things change. Um, one point I'd like to make on the slide that although we hear about many different applications, something that's rather unusual and that we see um, in Canada, we heard a couple, I guess the example from Northern England this morning, but not only people who are using ICTs for some kind of small business or entrepreneurship, including broadband, but those who are providing ICT services. And KNET is a fascinating example within Canada, and you heard about KNET yesterday from Andy Proctor. Another example is Whitetail, which is providing communication services in Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands. And in Alaska, there are several native-run um, telephone cooperatives. Um, and we don't tend to pay much attention to people that are developing their own ISPs as part of the entre um, um, part of the entrepreneurship benefits in providing services, not just putting them to use. And KNET's a fascinating example of that. But as I said, the, the, <laughs> the benefits remain elusive and difficult to find out. But that's nice, but it doesn't really get to the so what question. So, you know, you can do a case study or you can get macroeconomic data, but why might broadband make a difference? And um, to take a lot of research and condense it into four points. Um, it seems to me that the impact of information communication technologies and now broadband, and which kind of underlies the minister in Finland's uh, comment about broadband being basic human right, she means access to information. Um, so we see efficiency, which is the main business case, what you would find in case studies in a business school about saving time and money. Uh, arranging logistics, getting products to market. Um, long ago in Northern Ontario, just having two-way radios helped um, create Ojibwe fishermen get their fresh fish to market um, in a timely and cost-effective ma manner. Um, there are examples of other types of products. Um, I think this is the easiest one to understand. Effectiveness is probably a little trickier in that it may or may not be quantifiable, um, but Improving education and training. We talked about distance education, um, which can be for the students directly or support for teachers and students. Healthcare, which can involve consultation, specialized expertise, continuing education, and increasingly computerized medical records. There may also be efficiency benefits in, in all of these, but it's kind of improving the quality of service that, that is the main factor of, of this benefit of broadband or better communication. <coughs> And then something we've heard about here in terms of bridging digital divides, and we've heard about urban versus rural access to information. But there could be other um, um, indicators based on income or ethnicity in some regions, in some countries, disabled and other disadvantaged populations. And then reach, what about getting new markets? If you're a provider of something in a rural area, a product or a service, getting new audiences um, for your content, or getting different suppliers from the ones that you had access to only in your local store, and that sounds like the Tesco online example that we just heard about. Um, so that's kind of the framework of the why does better access to information, including through broadband, make a difference. We've heard a lot about access too, and I just wanted to add that to the framework before I get into the case study. Um, 
we've heard, I would, I would call the first part that we've heard some about in terms of the facilities, making those facilities available or the infrastructure available. We've heard about uh, wireline fiber in particular, but also DSL, and you can measure that in terms of houses or businesses passed. Um, wireless in terms of coverage of population and area, and people who do rural services know that those can be two quite different indicators. And it's often important to ask somebody when they say, well, we've covered 96% of, of our population. Well, that's nice, but what about your area? Because those other 4%, as we heard in some cases, are the tough ones. So the right metric can be important or can be misleading, shall we say, if it's not specified right. And in terms of satellite, what about the footprint of the satellite? Does it cover, for satellites, does it cover regions where it can really make the most difference um, and at what power levels? And unfortunately, in Alaska right now, um, we have a dearth of new satellite coverage to fill in some of the gaps where satellites have been very important in the past and they're still using. Um, affordability. Um, affordability is something that's come up in the past couple of days. Um, you can think about the equipment, the upfront charges, as we heard about in Scotland, the monthly fee, the usage fees. What do we mean by affordability? Up to you to, to define what metric makes sense for your population. One could be charges as a percentage of average disposable income, and that's quite relevant in the north where incomes can be quite low. Um, I should tell you that the CRTC has absolutely no metrics on affordability. Um, I testified at that hearing that Catherine Middleton mentioned yesterday, and we'll come back to that at the end of the presentation, on, on services, the potential um, requirements to serve in rural and remote areas. And a couple of us, I worked with the Public Interest Advocacy Center, and a couple of us brought up um, affordability, and there was both not much interest, but no sense of, well, how would you get at that? So I gave them about four different ways you could think about it, from the ITU, the OECD, the FCC, and a couple of others, and said, you know, there's various ways you could consider this, but it's an issue, um, and, and worth thinking about. Um, and then to get to adoption, and several speakers certainly today have said, well, yes, you know, getting stuff in is only part of the problem part of the steps and, and adoption is important and understanding adoption is really necessary. So this is important to understand because a lot of policy makers and perhaps funding agencies either domestically or internationally will jump right to that, okay if we make this investment what difference will it make? Or you know how soon will we know that investing in broadband or whatever the infrastructure might be, but broadband in this case, um, really makes a difference in something that we want to happen. Millennium Development Goals, we heard from the minister in Finland. Well, there's a whole set of things that have to happen um, to get there. So you need the infrastructure there, but then you need the adoption. And, and as we've said, some speakers have said, well, I, we don't know very much about who's using it or not, or we have some general metrics, but we don't know why people aren't adopting. Well, if you don't get the adoption, you're not going to get to the impact along the lines that I was describing in the previous slide. So many studies focus, do get to that adoption level. And there have been several quite good studies in the US um, coming out of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and the Federal Communications Commission in the past couple of years that have taken census data um, they've added some specific questions about internet and broadband availability and use and analyzed them. Um, and those are available online and in the paper I have the citations for them. Um, they do disaggregate by um, ethnicity, education, income. They're not very good on rural because the sample size is too small. Um, but even that doesn't get down to the what difference does it make. And typically in planning evaluation, um, that's where you need to go and in some cases that takes more time than there is funding for doing the evaluation um, or it takes more time than some of the funders would like to know in order to find out the impact. So that's why we fall back on case studies which are quite useful because sometimes you can identify a sector. Okay now the schools have broadband therefore they did X and we hope that as a result the graduates will be able to 
or as we heard in the um, Lancaster case, people, you know, students might come home to live if there's broadband, maybe. Um, but we haven't really got that far yet. But unless we work down through this, you know, it's just one other infrastructure investment. Um, something else that is kind of a result of thinking through all of these um, approaches is that connectivity in and of itself, I would say, is necessary but not sufficient. So obviously, if the infrastructure isn't there, you're not going to have the benefits of QED. But um, there are many other factors that could lead to first adoption and then what we might call purposeful adoption that, that leads to some social and economic development goal. We might have adoption, and, and this is a hotly contested issue. It sounds like the Scottish Parliament was, or Scottish Committee was concerned about the negative sides of access to the internet. People get on and just play games or get access to content that nobody would think is particularly appropriate or certainly worth putting in a policy priority. But of course, there are many other things you can do. But to get to those things, it's really important to understand the context. So the various case studies we've heard come from different contexts. Um, but you need to be sure that other infrastructure is available if you're going to, to have some of these business benefits, such as getting products to market or buying products online that you couldn't get before. And in terms of transportation, it's important. Um, Alaska, like Canada, has subsidized postal service, and that's been a great benefit in, in the Bush. Bush is not a majority of term in um, Alaska. It just describes people in remote communities. Um, neither is native, by the way. People use that word, or indigenous. They don't really talk about Aboriginal people there. Um, so, Or First Nations, although they're getting more accustomed to using that term. But anyway, I mean, you, you know, if, if, you, if it involves more than moving the information around, then you need to be able to get whatever those products are in and out. Obviously, you need reliable power, which is a problem in some remote areas. And even in New York City, we heard, you know, a couple weeks ago, and with floods, um, people's phones went down, their internet went down, because the power supplies were not there. Um, we need content that's relevant to rural areas. Um, some of the concerns about accessing content are, well, that's nice. I had, you know, that thing might be out there, but why is it of use to me? What can I do with it? Um, in some cases, languages, and then certainly um, some parts of Northern Ontario and some parts of the Arctic using indigenous languages is an important in terms of content. Um, and sometimes the software design, I mean, the, you know, there's cheaper ways to do things and more expensive. So bandwidth requirements Software that's designed to use a whole lot of bandwidth, even if more bandwidth is available, may be really either unaffordable or, or um, not very appropriate for communities if some content just hogs the bandwidth. Um, services in the cloud, people com complained in, in some parts of southwest Alaska that there was software online that they couldn't get to or they couldn't save big files online because it took too long and, and it was hard to access. So. You know, the software, even though we hear about the cloud being wonderful and eventually if everybody gets <coughs> a lot of inexpensive broadband, we will see everything there and it provides access. But it's a reality in terms of thinking about how people will use the network. Um, skills to use the facilities productively, uh, clearly in some cases tech support to keep things running. Um, and it's a term that's come out of the development literature called infomediary, somebody who can help the user. That can be just from providing little training. Here's how you get to the website that has the information you're looking for to more. Here's how you, I can help you find the answer to this question, even if you're not the one who's going to use these. And this can be off the traditional, it would be a librarian or in many cases a teacher, but it could be somebody computer center person in a community center or more and more, it just could be a kid. Um, young people certainly in terms of technical access are able to help others with less experience and if they had some good training themselves in school, they'll know how to help find relevant information, not just get online. Okay, um, now to, to move to the um, Alaska context, I thought I'd give you a case study um, of what we have learned recently about internet access and demand for broadband in Alaska, which is quite comparable to 
um, northern Ontario, northwestern Ontario, some parts of the Arctic in terms of the geography and, and communities and populations. So it's the largest state um, in the U.S. and Alaskans like to tell Texans that frequently. Um, and it's about one and a half times the size of Ontario. Uh, with, but with a population of only 710,000, of which half are in the main city of Anchorage. So it's about three times the size of the Yukon, but it has a much larger population than, than the Yukon. But when you factor out Anchorage and then Fairbanks and Juneau that have less than 50,000 each, um, still that leaves a, a small population spread over a huge area, but clustered in villages. So unlike eastern Ontario and southern Ontario, where people are on farms, um, these people are clustered in villages, as you would see in northern Ontario and other areas. Uh, Alaska Native population makes up about 15% there, um, with six major linguistic and cultural groups, a lot of tribes, and most, about two thirds of those people, still live in villages. There's certainly a lot of migration to hub communities and some into cities now. Um, like northern Ontario, the villages are accessible primarily only by boat in the summer if they're on a river <coughs> or bush year-round. Um, this picture at the bottom, if you can see it with four wheelers, which is popular summer transportation in many areas now, um, was put in by a librarian who was applying for funding for a stimulus project and she had to fill in how many parking spaces each library would have. And she said, I got so tired of these forms. So I finally just sent them a picture and said, look, you know, I mean, there's space, and if people have vehicles, that's not an issue. So this, this, was a, this was in an Inuit community on the Bering Sea at a festival, and they all showed up for the wedding festival. Um, Alaska here, just, not everybody knows where it is, but just to give you a sense of the context, um, it is close to Siberia. There are communication and, link and cultural affinities across here. There's a lot of contact with Northern Canada, and um, culturally people have a lot of affinity with other indigenous <coughs> people here, as well as there's a lot of concerns about the Arctic, and a lot of similar economic activity in terms of petroleum and shipping going on across the north. Uh, linguistically, uh, oops, what did I do? Hit the stop button. Ah, thank you. Um, Linguistically, I think this map is probably more relevant here. You can see that the Yupik and Inupiat people are related to the Inuit that go right across the Canadian Arctic. And the Athabascan people are, these people are related right across into central Canada. And certainly, um, Klingit, Haida, and Shimshin are related to the people in some in the Yukon and particularly in British Columbia. Um, the languages are very much alive in the region that we were working in here. So you would find a lot of people who do still speak Yupik at home. Um, the languages are much less widely spoken than in northern Canada in the other regions, unfortunately, although elders speak them and there's a lot of interest in keeping them, preserving them and using them more. Um, this shows the current networks. Um, these are fiber to the so-called lower 48, um, coming out of Anchorage, multiple submarine cables now, um, over to Juneau, the capital, and southeast Alaska, up the road system, and up the pipeline to um, Prudhoe Bay. But all these other little places, dots that you see, they might look like dots to you, they're satellite terminal. All this is served by satellite, all of it. And this is an area that was just coming off satellite that, that we're going to talk about. So satellite, um, community satellite with local redistribution for telephone service as well as TV has been since the early 1980s the way that most of Alaska gets communication. People are frustrated with it because of the delay and because bandwidth is expensive, but believe me, they would rather have it than not. Um, however, if they can get onto a terrestrial network that has less latency, or capacity, um, they're clearly most are interested in doing that. So this is a case of upgrade. I mean, I worked in the first phase, which was getting telephone service into these places. So every community in Alaska, 25 people or more, must have telephone service. There's not yet a policy saying should they all have broadband or something in addition. Uh, something else you need to know before we look at the data is that 
Um, Alaska Village Schools, yes, they're similar to schools in probably Northern Ontario, except that um, they must offer up to grade 12. If they're 10 students, they have to offer, that was the result of a court case that said that children no longer um, must be forced to go away to residential schools. They must be able to take grade 12 in their community. That's been around for 20 years now. It's become controversial again because some people have said, well, are the village schools really very good? Um, and clearly you can see that you would only have a couple of teachers maybe for 10 or 12 kids and they clearly can't have all the background that you would warrant in a high school teacher. So already the, the internet is used for um, supplementing content that's available in the communities and in some cases providing advanced placement foreign languages and other content that couldn't be made available, um, science courses. and. That's been a priority, and there's a subsidy program that, that I'll come back to uh, that subsidizes internet access for schools across the country, and, and Alaska is a big participant in that program. Um, also, the healthcare system has been a major user of communications for several decades. Um, the equipment, as I was thinking at Penny's presentation yesterday, the equipment on, whoops, um, on the right here is quite similar, I think, to the stations that you saw in the clinic she showed a picture of with, um, in addition to the telephone, um, some computer access, um, also, um, EKGs, other things that you can do uh, ritually over a narrow band line. Now most of them have more bandwidth. They also can send digital pictures um, just as email uh, to a, a hospital and increasingly more and more data from the regional hospitals they can send digital x-rays into Anchorage in the major medical center there or into you know, a, a radiologist reading them anywhere in North Dakota or Australia or Vancouver Island or wherever. So this program has been up and running for a long time. It has a separate history. It has really good data that shows they've got 10 years of data, which is a very good case study on telemedicine and cost savings in terms of travel substitution, which I have in the paper. Um, also, they have benefited from another federal subsidy, so some communities would have much higher speed to the clinic, but not to other people in the community. Um, people are already using the internet and broadband where they have it to um, try to market products. Um, and you see some examples there of Alaska salmon and the products, certainly for tourism, um, getting market information competitive bids, sources of supplies in villages where they couldn't before, um, cultural preservation along the lines that Penny was describing yesterday, quite similar, um, history, uh, one of the regions, Yupik re no, I'm sorry, Inupiat region did a deal with Rosetta Stone and has um, got learning their version of Inuktitut now in a digital form through Rosetta Stone and is making that available online as well. Um, a little bit of outsourcing, insourcing work for distant clients, that's something I think that could be developed more. Um, Kivyut is uh, made from musk ox and it's sold all over the world. And there's a branch of the Inuit Circumpolar Council in Alaska and they have um, contacts right across the north and with, with Greenland um, and with Siberia as well. So they're already doing some of these things, but in some areas there's not much bandwidth or it's quite expensive. So coming to the project that we were working on, um, someone asked yesterday, is there something like the Eastern Ontario Network in Alaska? Well, I said, sort of. So this region here um, is the part that's being upgraded. And, and since, we, since we did this work, they've also got funding to go up here to Nome. And they're going to come across to Cots of you up here. And the eventual plan is to kind of do a ring, connect over here with a fiber and microwave ring. But then that still means getting out to some of the villages will be, some of the villages in this region are really still, there's no plan for them. And we have <coughs> offshore islands and there's no plan for them at the moment. Um, this is a network that, for those of you interested in the technology, is fiber from Anchorage and over to here through through this lake, but then goes on to microwave. Um, 
So a lot of this is um, digital microwave, point-to-point -point microwave, because the terrain is just too difficult to put in fiber. So I'm really interested to see how the Northern Ontario project goes, because some of the terrain is similar, although there's more mountains in some of this region. But in terms of permafrost, muskeg, rock, um, it's not like trenching through your garden in Lancaster. <laughs> Although I thought that was a great example. So these are primarily Yupik people, um, Eskimo, as you might say, and with a couple of major towns where there's commercial fishing down here, and a major hub community, Bethel here. Um, so they, just to summarize, there are 65 communities of which 60 are villages, and fishing is a major activity, either commercial fishing, um, which is very seasonal, and, and the, major, the major salmon fishery in the country and in the wild salmon and one of the major ones in the world, other subsistence activities, and a lot of the public and social services that you find in the north here. Um, there was 89, 88 million in grants and loans to build the network as part of the stimulus funds a few years ago. We are doing the, we did the before save phase this year to talk to people before they got broadband. Um, we did telephone interviews uh, with 340, a random sample of both landline and cell phones, and um, took a lot of callbacks, but um, we eventually got quite a good sample, and about close to three quarters of them are indigenous people or indigenous people in our sample. Um, we also did interviews with regional businesses and nonprofits, and we intend to follow up with that and economic activity. So um, you can see that, right, just to explain this here, these are the towns with commercial fishing, so their incomes are higher. This is the hub, which is mostly indigenous. You pick quite a large, about 3,000 people here. So their incomes are higher. These are the villages, uh, communities in small villages by census area. So you can see that um, incomes are lower, house, um, it's a younger population, more kids per people per, per household compared to the state, which is in the red. Um, unemployment is high in the villages, less so in the commercial fishing areas, although people often work seasonally here. But people still have partly subsistence incomes in, in the villages. And this is relevant in terms of how much disposable income you have, um, and much higher than the state wide average. Um, but we did find that people tend to use the internet at home. Um, this is not broadband, but 60% of the residents, in, and this includes people in the villages, had internet at home, um, although it was a higher percent in towns than the villages. But still, it was close to 50% in the villages um, and considerably higher in a couple of the towns. Um, and the two-thirds of the people who use the internet said they used it every day or almost every day. So if they have it, they use it a lot. Um, as I said, it's only about 50% in the villages, but still it's higher than you might expect. And definitely almost 80% in, in the towns. So people said, yeah, we have it, we use it. Um, we did various breaks. We did not ask people their incomes. We didn't think that was an appropriate question, but you can tell from um, generic unemployment rates and from education levels, which we did ask them, um, something about how those might correlate with usage. And this is not surprising in that people with more education um, tended to be to use the internet more frequently. But I thought it was interesting. There's really, you know, clearly people with college degrees are the greatest, but the drop-off isn't really to get right down to people that hadn't completed high school, and, and this is not surprising, but this is this is the population where there's probably less interest, how can this be useful to me, or what skills or equipment do I need, but also my kids are starting to use it in school, and so even this population may not be major users, but they're interested because they see that it's coming and that their kids are using it. Um, the internet. And, and several of the schools in this region have a program for providing, as someone else mentioned in some other contexts, either laptops that kids can take home so they can work on homework and their families can also use them, or in some cases now tablets. Um, so that's where we get the high usage. But something else that was interesting was that people said that, well, 
even if I have the internet at home, I tend to use it also in the community. So um, the red is, I don't have internet at home. Well, you would expect those people, if they're using it at all, would use it somewhere else. So at school or at work, libraries or in villages, tribal offices. But even people who have it at home say, oh yeah, I use, you know, school, work, um, library are also important. This is interesting to the librarians and others because community access for broadband looks as if it will be important as well, even if people s sign up at home. And this was different from the federal data. Um, I, I meant to tell you that we did include several questions that were identical or as close to identical as was appropriate to the studies, the national studies by the National Telecom and Information Administration because we wanted some comparability because they, they acknowledged that they didn't have either a large enough native sample or certainly a large enough Alaska native sample or rural Alaska native sample. So they were quite interested in our findings. Um, we did find that people have a lot of gadgets at home. Um, those who are online typically have laptop computers or desktop computers, but there were also a lot of game systems, smartphones, tablets, iPads, um, some netbooks, and that they were trying to connect everything, except, except perhaps there, there's not so many people trying to connect their game systems, but they want to. But they said the speed was just too slow. So they're trying to connect all this stuff. Um, and they were pretty frustrated if they couldn't do it very well. Um, mobile communication has increased dramatically in the Bush areas in the past few years with um, extension of mobile Basically, typically at the moment, just 2G or 2.5G edge service in some regions, although there's some upgrades to 3G. Um, and people are definitely putting it to use, um, not only in the communities, but um, out on the land and in boats if they can get coverage. And they're quite frustrated that the coverage is not completely universal. Um, so 87% of the people in our, in our survey said that someone in their household had a cell phone. Um, voice and text were the most popular uses, but people also talked about, and I have a data chart of, of other things they did, phone, music, games, some social networking. What happened? <laughs> Sister is powering up. I can talk. Um, some social networking, I thought it was interesting yesterday when Penny mentioned Facebook, because people mentioned Facebook a lot. And when we said to some of them and then some of the providers, well, okay, if there's only 2G or 2.5G in these communities, how are they doing some of the stuff? And the answers were varied. Well, sometimes we do some things that's slow, but we do it. Or we do some of those features when we're in town and we can't do them all in the village. Or, um, and or, um, well, we go to the school. There's Wi-Fi at school. Um, and because there's Wi-Fi at the school, we can get on the Wi-Fi with our smartphones and access Facebook that way. So um, I think that this also points out that there's a lot of interest in mobile services and that, as some other speakers have pointed out, I don't think Alaskan planners have paid enough attention to the importance of, of mobile connectivity with whatever the devices happen to be in the future, tablets now and smartphones, but where. Did I do something? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, but voice is still the most important. Um, when we ask people how they might use broadband, if you had it, what would you do with it? Um, social networking, and a lot of people specifically mentioned Facebook, was top of their list. Um, other things they mentioned were music, downloading video and movies, um, playing games, also education, um, using Skype and some telecommuting. So clearly entertainment is a major driver here. Um, it has the network provider a little worried because they don't know really how much bandwidth movies are going to suck up. Um, but they have priced, you'll see in a minute that price is really a concern to people here. And one of the reasons is that the provider has put caps on the network at the moment and charges more, or says it will charge considerably more if you exceed those caps. And so downloading movie may not necessarily be something that's particularly cheap to do, but there are not a lot of options in the communities. Um, pricing, I should mention, 
talk about that without showing you anything. The price for um, two mates down, and I can't remember, maybe 512 up, is about $65 a month and a little cheaper to find out. Um, and that's without any caps. Um, there was a, there was concern about pricing, so the uh, providers put in a package for $30 a month, but it's only $768 down and I think $256 up. So on the one hand, they've said, well, here's a cheaper option. On the other hand, that's not broadband, and that's not what they were received the subsidy to put in. So I, I believe that pricing is going to be an issue that concerns them. What happened? <laughs> I didn't touch anything. <laughs> um, what else that I can't tell you about that I don't need to show, I don't need to show you really, but I'd like to. Um, in rural Alaska, there's also people that have their own satellite connection, and these are a little more analogous to the Explorer Net. There's um, Hughes, um, HughesNet and StarBand, so people have their own VSATs um, and they might have speeds from 768 up to maybe one and a half or two megs. And so we asked them, and I will show you the chart when it comes back up, how they use the internet because I thought, well, they're a little bit more like early adopters. We can say to people, well, what would you do? But if we look at people who've already kind of made the investment, and we saw that they were more likely to be in addition to the entertainment features, doing more teleworking, um, accessing government sites, kind of more purposive um, developmental applications, which isn't surprising, but it's a proxy, perhaps. Um, can, you speak can you speak five minutes until it comes back online? Mm -hmm. So what happened? I'm um, curious. The light, the light bulbs are cooling down right now, and they have to oh, reboot. So it's, the, it's the projector. Um, well, let me tell you some more about this, and then I can go back and show you a few of the charts that comes back up. Um, when we ask people, would you, are you, would you sign up for broadband? Um, about 45% said, yeah, our household, and this was residential, our household would sign up pretty much as soon as it's available. And another 45% said, well, maybe or it depends and so when you ask the probe well it depends on what price was by far the most significant factor to them um, only about 10 percent said they really weren't interested at all um, and these were quite different and i will show you the chart when it comes back up if i can um, from the national data which for rural either dial-up users or um, non-internet subscribers people were much more concerned about um, skills and relevance, where in Alaska, that was a very small percentage, and most people just said, well, I just need to know if I can afford it, but I think I want to use it. Um, but as I said, they expected to community access would be important as well. Um, we did also some case studies on broadband impact, um, and we talked to the fisheries industry and they said, well, you know, for all the reasons that we would like, we do payroll, we do back office support, um, we coordinate with fishing vessels, we have a lot of seasonal employees, yes, we would pay tomorrow and it could really make a difference. So that fit into that kind of um, efficiency element. Um, banking, there's not much banking in the bush and people could just scan and send checks and other things that are very hard to do now given the limited bandwidth for the air services and tourism business of course they could see both marketing as well as logistics um, and small businesses and the native organizations which some are, are the businesses and a lot of them provide social services for their regions and they said well you know we do we apply for grants online i think penny mentioned something like this and either we have to do it all online now and if the connection drops um, we lose everything, or we miss the deadline, or um, we have to do all our reports for grants online, and it's very difficult sometimes because the software they use doesn't work very well with us given the limited bandwidth that we have, or sometimes we have to wait till midnight to be able to upload from the Aleutian Islands. Um, also, they can't transfer a lot. One, one native organization publishes a 
newsletter and they do the newsletter electronically, but they have a print publisher in Anchorage and they said the file is so big it's very hard to get it to them. Um, but they also said we like to do training for people in our villages. We like to make webinars available to them and we like to do webinars um, because we think we could really use this tool. So they could see the tra training benefits as well. Um, do we want to are you at a natural break point where we can wait a few minutes? Um, Go ahead. Well, I can, let me, um, I can talk through the policy, policy part and then just come back and show you a few charts if you like, because the policy part. Um, I, Corey mentioned this, this morning, so the, the last part of my talk is kind of what are some of the policy issues in, in the U.S. and how are they changing? And um, how does that compare with Canada? So, as I think Corey from Tennessee mentioned this morning, um, there's a very different subsidy mechanism in the U.S., but one that's changing from what's available in Canada. So, there's a sustainability model that supports carriers for high-cost support, and there is a small model like that in Canada. Um, the CRTC does provide some support to carriers in, I can't remember what rate bands they are, I knew this a couple years ago, people in this room probably do. But anyway, Northern Ontario and Quebec and the Arctic would fall into those rate bands, but that's all. Um, in the U.S. there's also several other types of support for users. So this gets to the kind of CapEx versus OpEx issue that the CapEx is typically one-time funding for putting in infrastructure, which is what you have here in Ontario with EORN and some of the other federal and joint projects. But then there becomes the question, well, so what about the users from the point of view of affordability for them? And what about the providers from the point of view of sustainability or OpEx? And that's where the U.S. funding mechanisms have been quite different in the past. Um, so there's two programs that are designed for consumers. Um, one is Lifeline, which is a reduced rate for low-income voice subscribers. And another is LinkUp, which pays part of the cost for connecting to the telephone network. And these are only voice right now. Um, and there's a debate about whether Lifeline or dis discounted broadband should be, internet and broadband should also be there should be a similar subsidy. It's kind of analogous to the broadband as a human right, although I think the FCC would cringe for they could say that. They, they could think it, but they wouldn't say it. Um, but anyway, should, you know, so should that discount for low-income subscribers be extended to broadband? That's a question under the, the new um, National Broadband Plan, which came out in 2010. Um, then there are two other programs that support major public users. One is called the E-Rate for schools and libraries. It provides a discount of anywhere from 30% to 90% for connectivity, could be internet. It doesn't specify speed, but it certainly can include broadband. So the school district, in this case, has to apply or the school would be certified that they meet the criteria. Then they only have to come up with a difference. So in Alaska, most of the villages in Alaska qualify for 90% subsidy. So Ministry of Education, Department of Education or the school districts, depending on how the state's organized, only have to come up, say, in that case, with 10%. Um, the, this has been very popular in Alaska, jumped on this early, and for the companies, it's been a way to get into the villages because they're kind of anchor tenants. They know they're going to get paid the tariff rate. 90% um, comes out of the pot, 10% comes from where the school district, but the money's there. <coughs> Otherwise, they said we couldn't make a business case to go into these communities with any service except the voice that we've had to provide as a farm. Um, healthcare, rural healthcare has a subsidy that covers the difference between the connectivity in the village or your community and connectivity in a major urban center in your state. Um, we're we're going to need to reboot the whole system. Okay. So I don't know if you want to finish without the slides or if you want to um, take a five minute break. Let me ask the audience. <laughs> <laughs> 
Would you rather I just talk through the rest of it, or would you rather that I? Yeah, to get the projector back, we have to reboot the whole system, our, our apologies here, which includes the audio. So uh, we can take a break, or we can finish without the slides, whichever. Yeah, five-minute break. Five-minute break, and then I can. Can we take some questions, Jeff? Sure, I can, I can do that. Can take some questions? Sure, we can, we can do some questions. Let me just finish this one piece of, well, all right. So the, the, the subsidy programs in the U.S. are quite different. Now, when I come back, I'll show you the, na the new name <coughs> subsidy. And, and, um, and the healthcare one, the irony, which I'm not sure that the funders completely understood or even understand now, is that, all right, if you fund the difference between the cost in major, say it's like Toronto and Big Trout Lake, say. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of competition in Toronto. There's quite a bit of competition in Anchorage now. There's certainly not a lot of competition in our rural hub. So in fact, that gap in price is getting greater. So the subsidy's going up. And I've had some healthcare providers, I said, well, you must be getting close to 90, like the schools, all of the schools is kind of a mandated approach based on demographics. And this is a different model. And they said, well, actually, not more than that, like 95, 96%. And you think, ooh. Did anyone really understand that? And you know, if those subsidies went away, I said, would you be able to do a lot? And they said, no, we couldn't do you know any almost none of this telemedicine. So um, there is kind of a house of cards underneath some of this in terms of the financial support, and that's being changed with the new Connect America fund. So why don't I pause there and take some questions, or if you want to stretch? I didn't realize you had to remove the whole thing. <laughs> Okay, um, no, I do have a question. So, um, Kathy and I, uh, so Rural Ontario Institute and uh, myself and Wild Feather have been really talking a lot about uh, finding data, locating data for uh, the various partners, public and private. We need to find data to make a, to make a case for investing in rural broadband. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I noticed both from your presentation and from Corey's is that in the U.S., the adoption studies has, has gained, um, gained a lot of attention and, and you actually completed them. So here's my question. I know you'll be really frank with me because you know you've done it for a long time. <laughs> How much did it cost to do the adoption study and what was your sample size? And if you were in a situation where um, various agencies here in Ontario were being asked to find that, uh, adoption evidence for decision making. What other kind of lessons would you you suggest we think about? Okay, that. Well, there's nobody from Connected Nation in this room, right? or online. Um, so Connected Nation also provides some support in Alaska, as they do in Tennessee. They had done some studies, and we found that they really just they were they hired somebody in I don't know Tennessee. No, it wasn't in Kansas. They didn't really understand rural samples, oversampling, and so they had a couple of studies and, and we just really questioned their results, they were statewide. So the good thing about the institute that, that I've been directing is, although they hadn't done work in telecom before, I told them when I first came there, that's not important, the point is they're good researchers. And um, but it took us quite a while to draw to work on the sample, I mean, uh, our best data person just beat her head against the, the telephone sets. We could not get data from the, the data that we got. We, the telephone companies in Alaska, hmm. we could get the fixed line data, fixed line data set and draw a reasonable sample. We knew there were still quite a few fixed lines in that region. But we also knew that people were using mobile a lot. And that was much harder. None of the mobile carriers would give us their, their number sets. So they said for privacy reasons, they couldn't. Um, we did get generic kind of number sets or number of data that we could tie to the region. Um, we had to do a lot of callbacks because by the time we got the funding, and the funding was $125,000 for that first phase. Um, by the time we got the funding, we were into fishing season, which we didn't want to be, but we didn't want to wait because the build-out was going on. So we had to do a lot of callbacks. Um, we use phone because it's certainly cheaper than sending or training interviewers and sending people to each community, although you know that's another approach. And for some surveys, you would want to do that. 
So the phone rang. We couldn't use email because we didn't have the addresses and we didn't know um, how widespread email was out there. So for some follow-up, you might be able to do that. Um, so the methodology is important. I mean, as, as I said, the NTI, the, the national studies are quite good, except the sample, when you look at even rural, is not great. And if you divide down farther at the state level, it's, well, say, it's not very helpful. So on the big P, you know, I, I, I don't trust what, I don't mean that they, they, they know what they're doing, the methodologists at NTIA, the <laughs> Census Bureau, but if you look at Native American, American Indian, uh, Pacific Islander, I don't think those data really are worth much at all, because even their national sample is small. I'll be but, back to your slides here. Wow. Uh, leave it. Okay, I'll try to be quick enough. I've talked about some of these things already, but I did put a couple of pictures in. Okay, so, so this is, I was talking about mobile phones, and I thought some of you would be interested in this yeah, picture on the left. He's, um, he was the first person, Aboriginal Alaska Native, to win the Iditarod dog races in the 70s. So he's a legend in Alaska. He was in Anchorage, and of course people just wanted to talk to him, and he talked to my brother in the village. So voice communication on a basic phone is still important. Um, how they might use broadband, this is where we're. So you can see that entertainment is clearly what's driving interest in general. Um, and games, video, and we don't have good sense yet of how much people will do of that and how much they will do once they see the pricing. Um, people do have, as I said, some people have VSATs and typically they do some work from home as well as um, the guy at the boat is a trapper. Um, those are all um, bull skulls on his, hammered on his wall there. Um, he has a, a business, several businesses out of his home. And on the right is a woman who does both dog mushing and, and some tourist business. And they had a, their own satellite dish. So, so this is the slide I was pointing, saying where we, we thought it would be useful to break out what do those people do versus the staff in general. So you can see that um, the red is the people with their own satellite installations and the blue is is everybody so they do a little more of everything but they certainly did more of uh, government services banking um, education training telecommuting health care um, Skype so that's what made us think that there's going to be some more use of this kind of purpose of use as, as well as just entertainment use among those who subscribe but that's just kind of a proc looking for a proxy for early adopters. Since the, the follow-up study, we want to do it another 12 to 18 months after the broadband has been in. Um, as I said, people who um, won't sign up, 72% said price. Price is much more important to them, to most of them, than I'm not interested or I have other concerns. And this was a chart that really interested the federal people because we compared our results with that same question with, with theirs for either non-internet users or rural dial-up users. And the blue was Alaska, so you can see the price was much more on their minds, although it was an issue for the others. The equipment was of some concern. They, they really weren't nearly as concerned about, um, this is something of interest to me. And in terms of, there was some concern about privacy, but their, cons their concerns were much less about do I want it then, can I afford it? So I talked about case studies. Um, just to switch to the last piece about policy, sorry, quick here. Uh, as I, I pointed out, I gave you the example of the, the subsidy programs for um, education libraries and rural health care, which are really critical to the business model as well as the high cost fund for carriers in that region, as well as obviously to the schools and libraries and health providers. Under the Connect America Fund, which is part of the National Broadband Plan, the emphasis is changing to broadband. So Corey mentioned a bit of this this morning, but just to show you what it means in Alaska, the business subsidy business model is changing for the carriers. They're very concerned about it. They disagree with what the FCC is proposing. They're fighting like crazy. Um, but the reality is that the subsidy program will change. Um, and they have to provide broadband in order to continue to get a voice subsidy. They have to provide broadband. 
Um, there will be the schools and library and healthcare programs will continue as far as we know. But anyway, their business model, which is highly based on long-term subsidies, is changing and that means that they are totally focused on that issue at the moment. Meanwhile, the federal government, and this is quite different from Canada, I think, um, in addition to setting up the Connect America Fund, is really placing considerable attention and significant money on remote and tribal areas. So I mentioned they're replacing the high cost support with a different type of subsidy. But they're also saying that any carriers that serve tribal lands, and all of Alaska is considered to be tribal land, as well as parts of the Southwest, North Dakotas, Hawaii, and some other areas, must engage with tribes. It's not clear what that means, but it's now a requirement that the providers must talk to the users. And I don't know of anywhere else in the world where that's a requirement. If you get a subsidy, you must talk to your users. So this is very new. Um, the people from the FCC who were up in Alaska in the summer said, uh, we don't have a particular model. The company said, well, how do we do this? What are we supposed to do? Well, it's up to you. We want you to give it your best shot, but it's not just to check the box. We want you to put really significant effort into this. So that's an opportunity for much more native engagement. Um, there's also a mobility fund with $300 million for mobile voice and broadband in high cost areas which would be, say, remote areas, and $500 million a year in ongoing support, so there's some operating funds. The first auctions were just held in Alaska, and one of the carriers in Alaska did bid on 3G um, auction support. You can either bid to put in 4G or 3G with different time frames. They're reverse auctions. This is the first time they've been tried in remote areas, and the information is now online if you want to see it. But there was one carrier that um, it seemed to have no competition in Alaska and got everything they went for except the person I talked to said they actually, the FCC ran out of money so there were a few places they didn't get. Um, another place is in Vermont where I know an owner of a phone company who seemed to do very well and got a lot of licenses there too. Um, there's additional capital for tribal areas. There's a remote areas fund which has not been used yet of $100 million a year. Um, so unclear how that will be used. There's a broadband, as I mentioned, there's a question about should Lifeline um, be extended to broadband. And there's a pilot program for which there are no applications in Alaska, unfortunately, um, to run projects and evaluate them to see whether subsidizing broadband was something that the FCC should do. When we asked the carriers why nobody applied, well, they couldn't see the point either they could they would only serve some of their customers and not all, or they couldn't see how this fit in with their business model, or they didn't know how to do evaluation, although we could help them with that. Um, but mostly they were saying, we're not interested because we're so concerned about our ongoing revenue. And this made the indigenous population people pretty frustrated. They came to me and said, well, how can we participate in these programs that we just heard about? And I said, you can't, you know, only the companies can. We have to convince them. So there's a new Office of Native Affairs and Policy in the FCC, nothing like that in the CRTC or Industry Canada, as far as I know. Um, and there's a National Native Broadband Task Force, of which there are two members from Alaska, who are supposed to be providing guidance specifically on indigenous issues. So these are very new in, this, in the Obama administration, and, and we'll see how they turn out. But there's significant money and, and definitely commitment, but not a lot of understanding, I think, about how to really help these things take hold in the areas they want to serve. Meanwhile, the state is preparing a broadband plan, and that's kind of analogous to the work that you heard about in Tennessee. Um, Canadian policy, put that in question mark because um, Canadian policy. Um, Canada doesn't have a national broadband plan, as Catherine Middleton pointed out. Um, there isn't universal service support for providers except a little high cost um, high cost for some carriers. There aren't the kind of user sub subsidies or OPEX support um, or targets for affordability or price comparability. As I said, you put these to the CRTC and they were complex and not particularly interested. Either in setting targets for pricing as 
percentage of disposable income or even disparities. The U.S. The U.S. criteria are really quite vague. They talk about reasonably comparable prices and reasonably comparable services. You could, any lawyer can drive a truck through that, but in <laughs> fact, you can really make it work to your advantage to some extent. And I just wanted to reiterate what Catherine said yesterday about the broadband target that the FCC, I mean, the CRTC put in its decision. Five megabits down and one up actual speed to be available to all Canadian homes regardless of their location by the end of 2015. Now, um, that did come out of that case and she cited it, it's also in my paper, um, where we with PIAC and I think we were the ones who said um, um, aspirational targets really have no meaning. They, they talked about aspirational targets of you know, this much by 2020, and they got, the chairman was not very happy when we said we're not particularly interested in aspirational targets. And the measurable targets with real metrics and real usage, and lo and behold, they come up with that. But again, it's only going to be meaningful if you here and others um, keep their feet to the fire and say, okay, um, we're measuring this, and yes, you've accomplished that, and no one cares pockets where it, it doesn't exist and report that. I think that's really or not. We can say it's just going to be part of some national policy eventually. I don't know. Are these the right numbers? They're kind of not exactly what anyone proposed, but they're not bad to start with. Um, so if, if this is going to have any meaning, it's going to be because users say, okay, you've done it, you haven't done it, or you've done it, but nobody can afford it, or whatever. Um, but it's really going to be up to Canadian users, I think, to see if this actually gets enforced, and then to, to move on to, you know, beyond that target, then what? So just to summarize a few things, so certainly entertainment's been a driver of demand for broadband in rural and remote areas so far that we've seen, and that appears to be true elsewhere. Um, affordability is really a keen concern among people with limited incomes or partly subsistence incomes, and I suspect that's true in Northern Ontario. Um, there's a need for digital literacy training in many areas, and we've heard some about that, how to get the most out of these technologies, people who can help with that. Community access, I think, is one of the things that we learned that people were very strongly supportive of, and, and in, in Alaska said that, you know, no matter what, even if we get something at home, being able to have it at school or some other publicly available place all year long is important for us. Um, the support, I think, has to, to address not only the capex or infrastructure, the capital cost, but also the operating cost. And, and Canada hasn't really done much with that. The U.S. is tinkering quite significantly at the moment with how they do those subsidies. Uh, but most countries don't pay much attention to the operational costs, and that can stop investment, as we heard in some other places, right in its tracks. I think there hasn't been enough attention paid, certainly in, in Alaska and the U.S., and it sounds from some other examples here, to the importance of mobile and the dependency of people using mobile as well as mobile devices as part of the planning process. And maybe finally that, you know, to get people involved in this planning process or the policy process, it's going to take some work to get them engaged. I think when you see people get engaged, it's we worked out PIAC and its predecessors. Of, we worked with KMAN and Mowate for several years. I've worked with um, community and indigenous organizations in many different regions, and it can be a very important part of the process, but it takes some time and effort, and the FCC in the U.S. doesn't quite grasp that yet. They're well intended, but they're not yet, yet there. And I think you're just hearing what we've heard from Scotland and other places. Again, it, it, it takes some time and effort to get um, users, whether they're individuals representing their communities or institutional business users engaged in the process, but it's extremely worthwhile to do. And so, at last, we'll conclude. I'm um, happy to take some questions if we have a few minutes. Yeah, we have uh, time for a few questions. Okay. If you don't ask me questions, I'll start asking you questions. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Heather? <laughs> Anyone think Canada will have a broadband plan, or is that a meaningful, a meaningful concept? Maybe the digital economy priorities are the best place to focus. Wait till the election. 
Yeah, be careful what you ask for. Does <laughs> <laughs> anyone think that Industry Canada will play a policy? I, I, for one, saw the CRTC a couple years ago kind of jumping into policy because this is only my interpretation that they're kind of a void. And so they used a regulatory approach to do it. But that might not be right. Anyway, somebody's got a So just a quick question on the, the subsidy math that you had up there. Have you translated that back into a per household subsidy? Um, translating that back into a? a per household subsidy? Mm -hmm. So uh, various cap programs and more broadly programs. And what are they really looking to invest on a per unserved household perspective right now? That's a good question. I haven't divided that all out. Depends on whether those subsidies, whether Alaska, for example, got a good share of those. I mean the, the remote subsidies would be pretty high, but the, the carriers the carriers can get up to several hundred dollars per month per household now, just for voice under that under the high cost fund. So what's happened in, is that the high cost fund, people are complaining about it because it, it's little charges on our phone bill because it's the US and the tax, nobody wants more tax. Uh -huh. um, a transfer from the phone companies, well, they don't want to pay. So they collect it and pass it through. But they've also been subsidizing um, mobile carriers concurrently and so that's going to stop. There's only going to be one provider per region that gets the existing high cost subsidy. So that's part of the change. But something else, and I'm not answering your question because I don't have the, it's a good one to, to get to. But um, what we're seeing is kind of a, at least in the region I talked about, and, and there's some concern among native leaders too, kind of quasi monopoly. Now, with the backbone being put in by one provider, whether they get a government subsidy or wherever they get the money. Um, <coughs> Since it's middle mile, it's not regulated at all. Uh, and so the pricing, both to the end user, seems quite high. We'll see what the demand turns out to be. But also to resellers who want to use that network and who are staying away from it. And from some people that aren't switching from satellites. So are we going to end up with kind of a publicly funded, privately operated, um, de facto monopoly serving remote areas, I think is. It's a different question from the one you asked, but it's one that puzzles me and it kind of leads to how much ongoing subsidy and, and how do you justify that kind of subsidy per household across the country. But there's certainly debates about is there too much money going into rural and if people in rural want a service, how they should pay for it. I mean, if the election had turned out differently, I'm sure you would have seen some of these programs change quite dramatically. 